thank you very much, Carol, for the introduction. And thank you to everyone for coming and braving the cold today um, to hear about uh, diabetes. And hopefully uh, this session and the coming sessions will give you a taste of some of the things we do here at the Garvin and a little bit of understanding about diabetes itself. So my job this morning is to give an introduction to the topic and to really lay the foundations for some of the talks that you're about to hear later this morning. I'm going to begin by speaking about what causes diabetes, which is probably the most common question I am asked as a, as a clinician, and then talk a bit about the differences between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. I'm going to give an introduction about why treatment is required uh, and what the rationale is behind diabetes prevention, which is the topic uh, later this uh, morning, and then um, uh, end by a bit of a a, a taste of some of the research that we are doing. So there's no better place to begin than at the very beginning. And um, this is a timeline of the history uh, of what we know about diabetes today. And you can see that as far back as 1500 BC on papyrus leaves, there were obvious descriptions of an illness that looked like diabetes. Um, and it also um, was described in um, Greek literature by Arataeus, who is probably the forefather of modern medicine, where he described an illness where great masses of the flesh are liquefied into urine. And around the same time in Hindu literature, there was a description of an illness with honey urine. I should just point, uh, ask quickly before I continue, can everybody hear me? clearly, including at the back. Okay, great. So with the honey urine, there were descriptions of ants and bees being attracted to the urine of certain patients. Um, and the first inkling of uh, mention of this illness in the English literature uh, was in 1674, where Thomas Willis used some quite descriptive language, uh, posting uh, an article describing a pissing evil. And I suppose if you have diabetes, you might consider that this is a true description. Now, uh, it took another 100 years before we began to understand more about what causes diabetes. And Matthew Dobson went above and beyond the call of duty and distilled the urine of his patients over a Bunsen burner and found that it formed white crystals. And then he decided, I don't know why, to taste it and found that it was quite sweet. So he described this sugar in the urine. Uh, in another 100 years, with the invention of the microscope, uh, Mering and Minkowski, um, sorry, Mering and Minkowski before the microscope found that if they removed the pancreas out of dogs, they could simulate an illness like diabetes. And shortly thereafter, uh, with the microscope, Eugene Opie described these islets of Langerhans, which you might be able to see as the blue dotted areas in that pancreas diagram there, which is where insulin is made. Approximately 20 years later, Banting and his medical student, Best, uh, extracted insulin from the pancreases, again of dogs, and injected it into people and found that they could control the diabetes of these people. And they won the Nobel Prize for this, and Banting, um, who got the prize, uh, shared it with his medical student who had done most of the work. So what about today? Where are we? So this data is Australian data, and we know that approximately 300 people every day are newly diagnosed with diabetes. So it's a really common illness. Uh, the incidence and prevalence continues to rise, and it, it affects over a million Australians, so a su substantial proportion of the population. And if you have diabetes-related complications, it's costly not just to yourself but to the community as a whole. So what causes diabetes? Or another word that I would use is what is the pathophysiology of diabetes? And in order to understand diabetes, clearly there's a clue in the um, beginning there, we need to understand how insulin works in the body. Insulin is a hormone that is made by the pancreas whenever there's glucose or sugar in the blood stream. And glucose, um, sugar is a, a, and sugar, glucose and sugar can be used interchangeably. 
You can see the spleen, uh, sorry, the pancreas there sits in the, um, the middle of the abdomen and when you look at the pancreas in cross-section, it's made out of places to digest food but then places to make hormones like insulin. Now the role of the insulin is to allow the glucose in the blood vessel to leave the blood vessel and enter the body cells where it can be used as an energy source or a fuel. I envisage the insulin like a key that opens the door and lets the glucose out of the blood vessel into the cells. And you get diabetes when your insulin either doesn't work properly or isn't there. And because of that, the glucose level in the blood rises and the energy levels going into the cells is much less. Now, how do we diagnose diabetes? Now, people may present with symptoms like feeling tired or thirsty, going to pass urine frequently, having blurred vision. Sometimes people have weight loss or more infections than usual. Sometimes they don't have symptoms and they have a blood glucose level tested on a blood test and either a fasting or random level that is above these targets is diagnostic. Sometimes an oral glucose tolerance test is ordered by the doctor where um, in Australia we use the 75 gram load of, of glucose, which is a lot of glucose actually. It's about the same as five slices of bread uh, equivalent. Um, and then if your glucose rises after drinking that, you could be diagnosed. And there's also a way of diagnosing diabetes using a blood test called an HbA1c, uh, which might not be suitable for everyone, but your, your doctor might order that as well. So what are the differences between type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Well, I've already alluded to the fact that the pancreas, which is the yellow blob up the top, makes insulin. And the insulin has a, has a lot of effects on the organs listed down the bottom. It not only controls blood glucose through letting glucose out of the blood, as I mentioned, but it controls glucose uptake in muscles, glucose production from the liver, and then um, fat um, breakdown as well. And the insulin being defective either occurs up the top where there's less production of insulin from the pancreas, that's what we call type 1 diabetes, or where there's insulin but the actions on the rest of the body are impaired and that's what we call type 2 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes is a lack of insulin and type 2 diabetes is resistance to the effects of insulin or what we might call insulin resistance. For completeness sake, I'll mention there are other types of diabetes but they're much rarer and I won't talk about those today. So a little bit more detail on type 1 diabetes. Lack of insulin, it's actually very weakly inherited. Um, if your father has type 1 diabetes, your chance of having it is probably between 2 and 6%, not very high. Whereas it's commonly believed that it's very strongly inherited, but it's not. There can be several causes, but the most common cause is autoimmune. This means the body attacks the insulin-making cells and breaks them down. There's a risk of a condition called diabetic ketoacidosis from lack of insulin, uh, which doesn't occur with type 2 diabetes very, uh, as often. And the presentation, or when it's picked up, is usually in childhood. But... Um, as Carol has mentioned, it can, uh, can be seen occurring for the first time in adulthood and I've seen it occurring for the first time in people uh, in their 60s and at above and this is, we call this latent autoimmune diabetes of the adult. But it's essentially a similar process. Now type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. This is really strongly inherited. If your father has type 2 diabetes, your chance of having it is about 60%. So much more strongly inherited than type 1. The cause is really not, we can't pin it down to one cause. It's multifactorial. And it's associated with a syndrome we call the metabolic syndrome, uh, which is other things like hypertension and high cholesterol levels as well. The presentation is usually in adulthood. But it's not uncommon for us to now see 
people in their teens and 20s presenting with type 2 diabetes where in the past we would only think of type 1. Now the treatment for both is different but I won't be speaking about treatment. Um, Professor Greenfield will touch on that. Now I mentioned this metabolic syndrome and I think it's important not to view diabetes as an illness or type 2 diabetes as, as an illness all on its own um, because insulin resistance which is the cause of type 2 diabetes is also the cause of many other health issues. So you can see there hypertension, obesity, dyslipidemia, fatty liver, cancers as well, cardiovascular disease and um, neurodegeneration like um, memory loss. So if you are picked up or know someone diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, your, your doctor and diabetes specialist will also be looking out and treating these other conditions at the same time. So why is it important to treat? Um, because the high glucose levels in the blood vessel do cause damage to blood vessels. And I envisage blood vessels like plumbing in the body. If they're nice and smooth, blood flows very well. Uh, but if they become rusty or what we uh, are affected by what we call atherosclerosis, then they can become blocked off. And obviously blocked plumbing is bad because whatever is at the end of that plumbing doesn't get blood and will die. And so that becomes irreversible. So what we want to do is prevent this type of damage to the small blood vessels in the eyes, the kidneys and the feet and the larger blood vessels in the heart, the brain and the legs. And so these are the reasons we treat, not because people feel sick, but because we want to prevent these complications. And we also treat the other parts of the metabolic syndrome, as I mentioned. Now, I'm not going to go through the diabetes medications just to show you this graph that shows from 1915 when we first worked out there was insulin all the way to now there's been a, a real increase in the number of medications particularly lately that we can use. So I'll just skip through those. So what about diabetes prevention? How can we prevent this strongly genetic condition? And I, I'm talking about prevention of type 2. Prevention of type 1 is still an area of lots of research. Now this is the rationale behind prevention. If you look at the green box, uh, if this is 100% of people, uh, about just under 4% have been diagnosed with diabetes. Another 4% have diabetes but don't even know it because they don't feel sick, remember. But if they had the blood test, they would pick it up. And then another 16%, so a huge amount more, four times as many as are diagnosed, have pre-diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance. And these people are at higher risk of progressing to diabetes than the general population. And this is a busy slide. I will only mention a couple of points to take away if you'd like to. Um, that light pink line is insulin resistance over time. You can see that it increases over time. The yellow line is the insulin making cells declining over time. This is what happens to people with diabetes. And because of that, the dark pink line, the plasma glucose, the glucose level in the blood rises. And when it rises at a certain point, we call that diabetes. But you can see this process doesn't happen overnight. This is a continuum. This happens slowly over time. So in that four to seven years before the diagnosis of diabetes, if you knew you were in that category, that would be a good time to intervene and try and prevent the progression. So who is at risk? These are things that I think everybody should know um, because these are the people that should at least go to the doctor or be picked up by the doctor to be tested for diabetes. Anyone over the age of 65, anyone with a family history, certain ethnicities like Asian, Indian, Middle Eastern backgrounds have very high rates of diabetes. Obesity, um, increased waist circumference. So if your waist circumference is um, more than 100 centimetres for men or more than 85 for women, you probably should go and uh, have a check. If you know you have prediabetes, if you had gestational diabetes, if you had polycystic ovarian syndrome, if you don't really exercise very much, and if you're on certain types of medications, you should really be screened for diabetes or prediabetes. 
So I'm just going to end on um, a little bit of a taste of some of the research I'm, I'm involved in very briefly. I'm not involved in all the diabetes research and there's a lot of diabetes research happening here. Um, but um, we are interested in looking at metabolically healthy obese people. There are people who seem to be protected from diabetes despite being as overweight as people who have diabetes. Other complications of diabetes, apart from the ones I've mentioned, we are now beginning to understand that diabetes probably also affects bone health, uh, which is a, another topic altogether. And then understanding appetite and satiety, there's going to be some uh, information on this a little bit later, but we're studying, for instance, Prader Willi syndrome, which is an inherited condition um, that, can that changes appetite and satiety. So after three and a half thousand years, we continue the journey of unravelling the mystery of diabetes. Um, so thank you for your attention. I'll just end by saying that diabetes is very common, that it is preventable or at least can be delayed to some extent, that diabetes and prediabetes can be picked up before there are symptoms and knowing the type of diabetes you have means that treatments can be tailored to you. And we're still learning much more about this condition. So thank you very much. Thank you.